The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. The gospel of the Lord. You bow your heads with me in prayer, please. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day that you have created and allowed us to share in. This morning, Lord, would you take our minds and think through them? Take my lips and speak through them? Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your son, Jesus? Take our wills and put them in submission to yours. In Jesus Christ's holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. On a uh, kind of remembrance personal note, uh, I'm not going to preach on the gospel today, but that is the first passage I ever preached on, ever, uh, 11 years ago. So every time I read it, I get a little, <laughs> um, a little, little tear in my eye. Um, it's a great passage, and uh, we'll do it again in three years. Um, last week, uh, we walked through a little bit of Hebrews 1 and 2. And we talked about this idea that in the world we look around trying to seek problems or solutions to our problems. We look around and we, we can't get there. We're, we're always busy and, and relentless in trying to solve our problems and get out under the weight of the world and the pain and the suffering and the mistakes and the sin. And the suggestion last week is if we look around, the idea is if we can't find that, what we are looking for, we need to look in a different direction. And so scripture tells us to look up to God and to Christ and to his power and and his salvation to pull us out of that darkness and out of the weight of the world. And in that, the promise and the reality is that God endows us through the power of his Holy Spirit and our faith with hope, with purpose, with direction, with family, so that we can then look forward in the world that we are moving in. We look around and we can't figure it out. We look up and God gives us that purpose and then we can look and move forward in the world with the strength of the Holy Spirit to carry us through those issues that we can't always solve. In that kind of trajectory, we see a transition. We see this. And I was doing it outside in the yard. It was a little easier. It's like this, right? Right? This is us. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to do better. I'm going to find, that's going to stop. I'm going to get the answer over here. I'm going to get the solution, right? There's, you see this? I'm doing this on purpose. There's a word for that. Restlessness. Any of you know about restlessness in your life? Today, yesterday, all days? Constantly seeking and hoping to get out from that which is a burden in your life. Well, restlessness has an opposite, clearly. 
if you're doing all that movement and you can't stop moving, then its opposite is more of the restful or rest. I almost fell. Rest. Look, you know, settled, content. Maybe not even so much worried. Definitely not so much filled with the fear that was over with that guy over there that couldn't seek to find the answers. And so the writer of Hebrews, in this whole book, in letters, or this whole sermon or letter, is trying to tease out this idea of restlessness into rest. And where we come to that is what he talks about in our passages today, 12 through 16. He alludes to how we make that transition, the who and the what, of what allows us, strengthens us to go from that to this. He talks, of course, today about the word of God. And he talks about the work of the person of God in Jesus Christ. It is through those that we move, that we transition from restlessness to rest. Or in other ways, we say from death to life. Now, if we talk about those, we have to kind of have a first a prelude. And it's not in your bulletins today, and you can look at the scriptures in your Bible. There are Bibles in the pew. They're not dusty either. They're brand new. Open them up. Uh, and you can look at verses 1 through 11, or you can do it after church. And you can hear the author set the stage. Because as happens, sometimes we cut the passage. And if we're going to talk about how the word of God and the work of Jesus allow us to make that transition from restlessness to rest, since we all know about this, I don't think we're confused about this, we need to understand this. And so what he does in those first 11 verses is he kind of gives us a background on what the idea of this rest is. And he makes some allusions to some Old Testament passages about Joshua and the Israelites and how they had many times been seeking this kind of rest in the promised land in other ways, and they never quite got there. They found kind of an echo of that rest or, or a shadow of it. But he says that the reason they never found the true rest is because, unfortunately, they were disobedient and unfaithful to the word and to the work of God. They didn't trust God, and so they couldn't get into that rest. But he then makes the illusion that that rest has been there and is there, of course, through the word and work of God, and specifically and eminently through the word and work of Jesus Christ, through his cross and resurrection. And he uses a word that is only used once in the scriptures, and here we hear it's Sabbath rest. It's a word that they think he may have created for this this sermon or this letter. Sabbath rest. That's the idea that is awaiting us. It's that idea that in the world of pain and suffering and toil and trouble and all of that, this restlessness, there has to be its opposite waiting for us in God if he is this loving, merciful God. And we've heard this in a variety of different ways. And so he tells us it's waiting in this Sabbath rest. So in order to understand how the word and the work of God get us to this rest, it's important to understand what this Sabbath rest is. And if I say the words Sabbath rest, your minds hopefully should go only one place. Genesis. Everybody remembers from the beginning. And God has created for six days. Day and night, day and night, day and night. It's good, it's good, it's good, right? And he's doing it. And then what happens on the seventh day? Do you remember? He rested from his labor. That's the first Sabbath. Now, there's something special to note about that seventh day. Every previous day has a beginning and an end. Look at Genesis. The seventh day doesn't. He rests on that Sabbath, which by theological definition in some mysterious way means that that day, that Sabbath rest that the Lord found himself in, guess what? It's eternal. Now, what kind of rest is it? Is it this idle rest where, you know, maybe you go to work and you don't have anything to do? Oh, this is a big thing at the bars, right? There's no customers, so what do you do? You sit around, we, we used to read the newspaper or, or you know, talk to the, to the pretty girl in the corner or maybe nowadays we get on the phone or whatever, right? It's that idle rest, like, I don't have to do anything right now. I don't, that doesn't really sound like God, right? And it's not that rest that after we work eight or 10 or 12 or 16 hour days, some of us have done that, maybe even yesterday or today, and we're exhausted and we what? We rest. We either take a quick nap on the couch or we pass out for 12 hours because we're so exhausted, rest. 
That doesn't really sound like God either, because God doesn't really take naps, does he? Jesus took a nap. God, not so much. So it's not idleness. If it's not deep sleeping rest, then what is this Sabbath rest? Well, look at what the scriptures show us. He rested from his creation. He had done all this work, and he rested. Now, he's not idle. He's not sleeping. He's there, so it must mean something else. Well, think about when you have created something wonderful and beautiful. How do you feel? Content. <sighs> Restful. Peaceful. Maybe a little joy at your creation. That's okay. Maybe a little pride. It's okay. God has given you a gift, right? It's that sense of contentment with something well done and complete. Creation. Ha! <sighs> right? This is that sense, but we also know that there's work to come, isn't there? There's activity that's going to follow, so it's not an ongoing sleep. It's a sense of contentment at completion with activity ongoing. That's why it's eternal. Now, if any of that theological phrasing makes an, absolutely no sense, I'm going to try a cheap metaphor, as I always do. No movies, no music today. You got that last couple weeks. I'm going to try sports and music in a different way. I want you to think about, in music and in sports, what it takes to become a preeminent musician or a preeminent athlete. What does it take? Yeah, practice. Those of you who have played music, those of you who have played sports, those of you who have watched music or watched sports, to be really good, to be the best of the best, takes practice over and 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 over. Why? Because the idea is if you practice it so much, it becomes second nature so that you don't have to think anymore. Those guys on guitars who move their fingers so quick, how the heck are they doing that? Because they played 12 hours a day and their muscle memory remembers. Same thing with sports. I played soccer in high school. Our team, three years in a row, went to the state championship. Had nothing to do with me because I was terrible. But the team went. Why did we go? Because during the week, we practiced over and over and over and over. The set plays where you're right in front of the goal and there's two guys and they wait until everybody moves and then they try to score, right? And the moves coming up from the back end of the field, going through and across and over. We practiced over and over and over. And we ran over and over and over. And two things became clear when we walked onto the field. We knew two things without abandon. We were in better shape than any team we ever played because we ran over and over and over and over and over and over. And we knew soccer better than anybody because we played it and practiced it over and over and over and our coach was a master. He imparted his wisdom to us. You see, what our coaches had done, and specifically our head coach, is he had created us. He had made us so good that we were barely untouchable. One of those years, we literally went 26 and 0. Nobody beat us. We were that good because we had practiced over, because our coach had created. Now, when he was done, when the practice was over, did he go away because he had nothing else to do? No. Did he go take a nap on the bench? Absolutely not. Have you ever seen a coach on the side? He got involved, of course, but what did he do? He said, now let's see what happens. And he let his creation go. See, this is that sense. That sense of an excitement and a, and a contemplation of completeness, completeness, knowing that what you have created is now going to go on. This is that rest. And with that comes joy and peace. Love, maybe. Even forgiveness. Whatever. All those aspects of God we've been talking about. This is what awaits us. This is the promise of Scripture. To go from this, I'm worried, life's terrible, man, this sucks. Sorry, I know some of you don't like that word. It's hard to stop it. It's painful, they're dying, they're losing, this is over, all of that, to this. Doesn't that sound nice? Just breathing deeply like that sounds nice, right? And that's what God offers us. And that's what the, the author of Hebrews is trying to tease out. It awaits us. 
Now, to bridge this chasm from restlessness to rest, there must be something to help us get there. And this is where our scripture comes in today. Long intro. Word of God and the work of Jesus Christ, our high priest. And he goes through both to remind us that this work is so deep and serious and needed that it takes a lot of serious, powerful work to get us over here. It's like telling a child to do something. How many times do you have to tell them? 100,000, right? If I went up to you right now and just said, hey, if you want to be restful instead of restless, how many of you are just going to be like, right? you got like 20 miles of thick pain and distance and suffering to go through to get here. It's hard work. So the word of God and the work of God in Christ. And so he goes through the work of the word of God. Now the word of God here, we usually hear word of God, we think the Holy Scriptures, absolutely the written word. And we also think of the other one, the capital W in John, Jesus, the word of God, the spoken living word. Of course, it's both of those, but it's so much more. It's the full revelation of God manifest in the creation, in the Holy Spirit, in the written word, in the living God, in Son, Jesus. It's all of that put together. And what does he say it does? Well, think about it. When you're in the darkness and the mire and the muck and the pain and the suffering, it's hard to rip you out of that, isn't it? We feel alone and burdened and overwhelmed. In order to get us out of that, we need something that is alive, he says. We need something that is active, he says, effective. We need something that penetrates to the core of who we are. And he even lists how penetrating it is. Because if I just tell you all something, or myself, 50% of the time we're barely going to believe it or maybe not believe it at all. And we walk out the door, most of that's gone. So alive and active, effective, penetrating to the depths of who we are, to our soul, who we are as humanity, to our spirit, our connection to God. It's that deep. To the bone and marrow, he says. To our hearts, intentions, and our minds, thoughts. It's mind, body, soul, spirit. The word of God is so living and active and effective and penetrating, it literally goes through us. Because it has to wake us up to the reality that exists over here because we're stuck over there. Again, like telling a child a thousand times, you could get the candy if you stop doing that. Do they stop? They could get candy. Do they? No. How many times do we have to tell them? So what about a regular human who is stuck over here? It has to be something so powerful it rips us out of the darkness. This is the word of God. Now, he uses very dramatic imagery for a point. And I want you to remember this, because I don't know if you've ever really sat back and listened or believed these words at the beginning of our service. We call it the collect of purity. You all say it with me every Sunday. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and no secrets are hid. You say it every Sunday, or at least I think you do. I can't hear you most of the time, but do you believe that? Do you believe that God actually knows everything about you? Because that leads to a question that I'm giving you to, for your take home for the week. Do you believe God knows everything? Do you believe God knows everything in your heart? And more importantly, do you think you can hide from God? Just chew on that for a little bit. Because what scripture teaches, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, your answer should be, and you know it, I'm not even going to say it, I'm going to let you chew on it for a little bit. He knows everything because he created us. And in order to wake us up, he had to have this powerful life-giving force, his word and his son, to get us to get up and move over. And he uses dramatic imagery, this word he says, laid bare. He wants you to know that he sees everything about you, heart, mind, body, and soul. And to use that, he uses an image which, which brings out some kind of scary thoughts. But I want you to see how serious he is about opening us up. Because he wants to open us up so that he can renew us, change us, give us new life. So he can bring us from restlessness. I had to take a breath, too, to rest. So this word, laid bare, has some really interesting background in Greek. The word was used in culture for two things in particular. One, it was used for emotion in wrestling or in assassination. It meant when somebody would grab your neck and pull it up. Do you see what's bared? You see, the idea is that God has us in a position where our life is bared open to him. 
And the assassin would do this and then cut the throat. But in the wrestling move, it's similar but different. He's not killing you so much, or she, as the motion, the power of holding that neck is so powerful. And if you've ever, any of you wrestled? A couple of you? I tried that once in college with a fraternity brother who I knew was a wrestler, who was 5'8", 5'9", 130, 140. I was 6'3", 190. And I was like, Psh! I had had a couple beers. And I thought, there's no way. I got 50 pounds and eight inches on him. Let's wrestle. He got me in some position. And you know what happens when you get in one of those positions in wrestling? You know what happens? I couldn't move. I don't know how somebody 50 pounds lighter and seven inches shorter got me in a position where I couldn't move, but he did. It was astounding. I was humbled. This is the position that God gets us in when he lays us bare. He holds us into a position where our life is, is open before him, where we can't move, where in all of the living and powerful effective word that he has sent down. The question is, you've heard the word of God. You know about Jesus. You can't escape it. He uses another image. He relays this word in the Greek culture to flaying animals. Do you all know what that means? Any of you ever do it? I have, unfortunately. And I'm not talking about fish. I'm talking about mammals. In my limited wildlife biology research, I actually was taught how to take the skin off of a, of a mouse. It's surprisingly easy. But it's the image I want you to hold in your mind for the work of what God's word is doing to us because it literally peels it off of us so that you see the entirety of the being of that mammal underneath. This is how powerful and effective and penetrating the word of God is. And you have no recourse. You cannot escape it. You have a choice. Oh, God in his grace and mercy, he gives you the choice. He knows you can't hide from it because look, you're stuck. His life is bared, literally everything, heart, mind, body, and soul. And he goes, here's my word, here's my truth, here's my rest, here's my life, here's my promise, here's redemption through Jesus on the cross. Now make a choice. You think you can hide from God? Now I'm going to answer it. You can't. You have a choice. The choice that he shows to the Old Testament in Hebrews 4 is, guess what happened? They made the wrong choice. They chose poorly, disobeyed, disbelieved, and that is the choice. You can disobey and disbelieve the power and word of God, or you can have faith and repent and obey and follow. That's the choice. There's really no middle ground. I mean, you can take your time to make the choice, but you can't run away from it once you've heard, because its power is so effective that it has bared you to God. And now you've heard it. And now you've seen it. This is why it's so important for the second section today, 14 through 16, because all of what I just said is great. Some of it's a little difficult theologically. Some of it sounds nice and philosophical. But until you can touch it and taste it and feel it and hear it and see it and smell it, it's not really much of anything. And so God in his mercy sent his son Jesus Christ in the flesh to become one of us because he knew if we just heard it all the time and a bunch of fancy priests said it all the time and maybe every once in a while there was a miracle every once in a while, okay. But when God shows up in person in the flesh and he becomes one of us and he gets at least into the muck and mire to understand the restlessness, Jesus understands the, re the restlessness, he says it, he sympathizes with us. He sympathizes so much, he quotes himself in the psalm today. This is the psalmist in restlessness. Do you remember these words? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer by night as well, and I find no rest. Jesus himself cried these words in the restlessness of the power of the burden and the suffering of humanity because if he didn't do that, we could say it was just words in an old musty book. But God's like, I know that's what they're going to say, so I'm going to come down there. Because how do you bring God to humans 
and humans to God without somebody who bridges this chasm. You have to have somebody who is both God and man for God to bring this word to us and to bring us back to him. He had to be God and man because we couldn't do it. Because by definition, we live in this world consistently, constantly, every day, restless. We're seeking the rest, but we can't get there because it's whose rest? God's rest. It's the Sabbath rest. The only way to get there is for somebody to mediate, to bridge, to build a way for us to get the rest. And because we need dramatic and shocking imagery, because we need to understand the power and immensity of what God is offering, he had to do it in public, in the air, above the people, through his blood, crying out to God so that we would know in that moment he had done what we had done and he had crossed the chasm for us and with us to offer, to usher, he says, us into God's rest. You see, what the writer of Hebrews is doing over and over and over and is saying through his own experience and through the, the witness of God in Christ in flesh on the cross is, I get it. I'm not some God in a fairy tale book who doesn't understand, who sits up there and just tells you what to do, pulls the strings. I've been there. I understand the restlessness. I understand the pain and the suffering and the terrible days and the hard things and the mistakes and the sins to an extent, because he didn't sin. Let's remember that. Sorry, I forgot about that point. But he understands so that he can just say, come, follow me. Believe, repent, and follow me. If you don't believe anything I've said today, if I wasn't dramatic enough, if the writer of Hebrews hasn't opened it up, and if I haven't helped in a way, then listen to the words of Jesus himself, who literally puts this into a nutshell. This could have been a 10-second sermon. It wasn't, but it could have been. Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble of heart, and I will give you what? Rest for your souls. Jesus literally said it. If you come to me in faith, I will give you rest. If you take my yoke, if you follow me and obey what I have commanded and taught you, I will give you rest. They didn't do it. Many people haven't done it. They couldn't escape it, but they chose the other direction. Many of us have chosen the other direction. And today, here in this moment, the writer of Hebrews, the power of the Holy Spirit, using me as a vessel today is here to remind you that that Sabbath rest is not waiting you when you're dead. It's right here, right now, in your faith and obedience to the word and cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can say, Lord, forgive me. You can say, Lord, I believe in you. Lord, command me. Lord, guide me. And he opens the door and says, follow me to that rest that you are seeking. Outside of the restlessness. That rest can be yours today, now, and always. Through the word of God and through the work of our great and blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.